Bien, euh, merci de vous asseoir. Nous avons commencé le séminaire et je suis très heureux d'accueillir aujourd'hui le professeur Alexandre Lenchi de l'Université de Pise. I will switch to English because you will be speaking in English. And so welcome to Collège de France. We are very happy to have you here. Uh, professeur Lenchi was trained as a linguist initially and uh, now is the head of a computational linguistics lab. So he's really at the border between these two disciplines trying to capture algorithms that correspond to how we interpret words and how we interpret uh, sentences. And the key concept here is uh, distributional semantics, or we might call it vector semantics, the ability to represent the meanings of words uh, and uh, in a formalized mathematical computational manner and to see how these uh, concepts can be combined to generate uh, semantics at the sentence level. It's a very, very exciting uh, possibility, which I think is being open. You are all aware that computers have made huge progress in uh, processing language. So we are really looking forward to hearing about the latest uh, theory developments as well. And I close by mentioning that Professor Lenchi just published a book called, uh, what is it called? Distribution. No, he's going to publish. He's going, going to, to publish. publish. <laughs> very hot in the press, literally, and ca at uh, Cambridge University Press on distributional semantics. Thank you very much for being here. Okay. Thanks to Professor Dehaene for inviting me here. I'm very honored to, to give this talk to you. Uh, actually, my story is uh, it's even more complicated in the sense I was originally trained as a philosopher of language, and then I moved to linguistics and then to computational linguistics. So it's a long way home. But still, I mean, there are a lot of uh, family resemblances be between these fields. So basically, uh, um, th the first part of this talk, I will give you some hints about uh, what is distribution and semantics, which is uh, quite, uh, um, I mean, very active field nowadays in semantics, uh, uh, especially in, compu in computational linguistics and artificial intelligence, uh, although perhaps less known by and less used by uh, traditional linguists, also because it uses a different way to, to, represent, um, to represent meaning. And then I will uh, especially focus uh, on the use of distributional semantics uh, uh, to model uh, some aspects concerning the way we understand the sentences. So going beyond uh, the domain of words uh, to the domain of, uh, uh, of sentences and complex, linguistic, uh, uh, complex uh, linguistic expressions. I think I might need to, to switch off. OK. So. Uh, first of all, let's start from uh, the basics. So uh, concepts are uh, collections of features that are derived from our experience. So if we think about uh, uh, our concept of uh, uh, ch cherry, uh, we can see that, well, it's uh, usually formed by a lot of uh, uh, features derived by our sensory, motor, and affective experience of uh, cherries, tasting cherries, uh, liking cherries, hating cherries, uh, and, and, and whatever. And this is, of course, related to our exposures to objects and events. And this is basically, these aspects of our conceptual representation is uh, crucial in, uh, let's say, mainstream uh, uh, models of uh, cognition, so-called embodied cognition uh, approaches. But on the other hand, we don't have to forget that, uh, that we, have also lot, we are also exposed to lots of linguistic experiences. So we are exposed to lots of linguistic inputs from which also we derive information about uh, cherries. And uh, uh, so we derive information and features about cherries by uh, reading, uh, by listening, uh, by being exposed to language in general. Uh, and basically, uh, nowadays, uh, uh, after some wars uh, uh, that, were, uh, uh, that took place some years ago, Let's say that the main trend is to, uh, is to imagine that these types, both types of this information, so-called embodied information, so the ones that we derive from first-hand experience and the linguistic information are both uh, uh, related in our conceptual representations. So uh, the idea is that uh, we should uh, aim for some kind of so-called representational pluralism in the sense that concepts contain many types of uh, uh, information derived by different sources, exactly because our experiences are of very different types. But there are, of course, also domains of our, of our concepts, so areas of our semantic memory, that are perhaps uh, for which linguistic information is also perhaps more relevant and more dominant. So, for instance, we can think about abstract terms, 
in which, of course, we don't have perhaps a direct experience about uh, a reference or an object. But also, we don't have to forget that uh, we don't have experience of many concrete objects we talk about. So we probably read about aardvark, so we read and we listen about the cyclotrons, but we, we never experience one. So we have a lot of linguistic information about these entities without having really been directed acquaintance to them. And there is also lots of literature that, for instance, children uh, use a lot of distrib so-called distributional information. So use the context in which uh, words occur in order to uh, converge or to identify at least in some aspects of their meaning. So if we, have, uh, if, uh, we, are, if we take a verb like gorp in this sentence, the Mary gorp married the book, we can anyway identify the fact that it's probably something related to give. And in this case, GORB might be more related to say or to believe or to state and whatever. So linguistic experience is relevant for many conceptual representations. Now, this is concerning the content of concept. So we can assume that concepts contains both linguistics information and other type of, uh, let's say, embodied uh, experience, experiential, I think I, yeah. other type of uh, uh, experiential uh, information. So what about uh, the form of concepts? So, okay, uh, we assume that concepts and our conceptual representation are this amount of uh, different type of information, but how do we represent them? Well, traditionally in uh, uh, linguistics, uh, but also not only linguistics, also in cognitive science, uh, uh, concepts uh, and conceptual structures are represented with uh, symbols. Symbols which can be List of features like this, like saying that, well, we could say that a dog is something that is animate, it's not an artifact, it, it has features which you could, could call bark, uh, it has another feature that which, could, which you could call, it has four legs, and so on. Can be some structure like this, like saying that, for instance, a verb like enter represents uh, an event of something going into certain place, or can even something more complex, and I don't go into details of this. Okay, the only things that imports for us is the fact that these are symbols. These are just the formal structures that we use to represent uh, aspects of the meaning of these linguistic expressions. And we can also choose a different uh, representation, imagine that our uh, semantic memory is represented as a network of these symbols related by different types of uh, relations that link these elements. Okay, independently of the specific formalism that you may use, what all these things have in common? Well, for instance, uh, the fact that they are qualitative representational concepts. You can see there are no numbers in that, okay? There are just uh, qualitative symbols, okay? And in the symbols, you can either match or you don't match, like letters uh, in the alphabet. Uh, there are discrete in the sense that, uh, well, dog has this feature or does not have this feature, okay? There is nothing in between them, okay? And of course, uh, uh, and this also has problems in the sense that uh, uh, we know for large uh, experimental data that concepts are not rigid. The concepts have uh, fuzzy, uh, fuzzy boundaries are continuous structures. So there are a lot of in-between things, a lot of gradients in concepts that, of course, these type of models and representations can hardly tackle. There is another problem concerning this type of uh, representation. How do we choose our symbols? And the problem is that we usually choose them a priori. So we decide that, for instance, plus animate or plus bark is a feature in our model. And so the problem is that, okay, how do we identify the repertoire of these uh, symbols that we use for our semantic representation? This is usually uh, the duty of the linguist or the, or the uh, I'm, I'm really trying to destroy this. I'm sorry about that. I have, a, you know, this kind of Italian uh, waving way of using hands. This is part, uh, part, surely part, uh, part of my cultural endowment, so you have to forgive me about that. Uh, and uh, another point, another problem is the fact that, uh, in fact, uh, this uh, rigidity, these uh, uh, um, uh, of these structures, make them quite uh, uh, make hard to explain a lot of semantic phenomena. 
Okay, and the risk is that we have to, to, to make our semantic machinery much, much more complicated, exactly because uh, we need to address uh, complex phenomena that originally these symbols are not geared to. Another important aspect is that these symbols are amodal. In amodal means that they are formal structure. Okay, so how do we integrate, for instance, in these symbols uh, information coming from uh, perception or from other type uh, or type of modalities. And last but not least, uh, usually these models uh, don't come with uh, sound models to learn such a representation. So the problem is that uh, how do we acquire this type of information from, uh, uh, from, experiential, uh, from experiential data? And this is one of the reasons why, especially in this symbolic model representing meaning, uh, 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 let's say uh, the aspect concerning semantic acquisition are, so to speak, sometimes left out of the picture in the sense that, uh, I mean, it's hard to, to model it or to explain this process with this type of representation. Well, in cognitive science and uh, in artificial intelligence, there is, in a way, another different way to, to look at uh, concepts. And the idea is that concepts are not symbols. Conce concepts are mathematical structures and essentially are mathematical structures called vectors. We can simply see as a row of numbers. And these numbers here stand from features that are extracted from our different inputs. So the idea is the fact that we experience inputs. For instance, we experience a cherry, and we extract some features from that, and we turn into numerical numbers. And this is not very different from what our brain does, in which we experience the features, these features, uh, the, uh, cherry, these cherries uh, uh, brings uh, or produce some input uh, into our retina, which is then to translate into signals uh, to our neurons uh, that activate some areas uh, in the brain. Okay, so we can imagine that also the neural, the, the neural activation in the brain is just a series of numbers that you can represent at a certain abstract level as a vector. Okay? Uh, so this is a very different type of represent, representing concepts and a very different type of representing meaning, of course. Uh, what is the main features of this type of representation? Well, first of all, it's continuous and distributed. Distributed means that, that basically all the information bring by, this, con by, by this, this entity is distributed between the different numbers. Is the, it is the ensemble of these numbers that bring in some kind of representation. For instance, the representation of a dog versus the representation uh, of a cherry. And of course, it's continuous because it has, there, it has numbers in it. So we basically have, we don't have a discrete uh, representation, but a continuous, uh, uh, continuous representation. And so this makes uh, this representation more uh, um, uh, apt uh, to tackle exactly phenomena concerning gradients uh, and fuzziness and, uh, and whatever. On the other hand, uh, another problem is that this type of representation are exactly less stipulative in the sense that basically we don't uh, usually choose a priori the type of dimension, but we let uh, imagine that these dimensions so the, in the vectors are learned or acquired uh, from the data without deciding a priori which type of dimensions uh, uh, should be relevant. Uh, and this allow, uh, and we will see in, the, in our cases, to have also methods to learn such representations uh, from, from the data. And this brings a semantic acquisition back into the game, so to speak. Okay. Uh, importantly, uh, in vector codes, uh, these, ve these features are not necessarily a model. As you can see here, I mean, these features could encode both uh, uh, features coming from language, but also features coming, for instance, from our perceiving SRA. So this means that actually this type of representation allow a better integration of different type of information coming from different, from different sources. Uh, as for now, there is nothing specific concerning distributional semantics. I mean, uh, this is a usual standard way of representing concepts in artificial intelligence and cognitive science in the age of uh, uh, the connectionism back in the 80s, uh, more or less. Uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, we will see these representations have, in a way, some problems, in the sense that uh, they, start, they have still some limited explicative power of semantic facts. So we still have to, to find a way to explain uh, 
different type of semantic phenomena with this type of representation. And we have to keep well in mind this fact. So basically, what is distribution semantics? Well, distribution semantics is a way to put these two things together. Use vectors to represent the fact that linguistic information is also important in order to shape our conceptual representation, okay? So basically, it brings together these two aspects, the importance of language as a source of information for our concepts and a specific way to represent concepts uh, with, uh, with vectors. Uh, basically, distribution semantics is just the study or a, very, a research area that focus on how the statistical distribution of uh, lexical items in linguistic context uh, can be used to model our semantic knowledge. So basically, it answers to a certain specific questions. How the, the fact that we observe, that we use language in a certain way, affects our semantic representation, okay? How the fact that a certain word is used in certain context uh, with other words, while not in others, uh, affects the way we uh, represent the meaning of these words. Uh, what is the uh, way in which distribution semantics uh, tackle the uh, semantic representation? Well, basically, as I told you, distributional representation of a lexical item, of a word, is just a vector. But this vector encodes uh, distributional data. So encode co-occurrences of these words with other contexts. So how many times uh, or some more complex uh, mathematical function or mathematical operation of this, how many times uh, a word has been observed together with other words? And uh, at, the, at the basis of the distribution semantics is what is so, the so-called distributional hypothesis. Namely, the idea is that the words, so lexeme, with similar distributional properties have similar meanings. So basically, if two words tend to, co -co to occur in the same linguistic context, they will tend to be very close in meaning. So if we, if we flip the pancake and we can say, okay, I can take a word to words and I can record how many times they've occurred in context, in, and if these words uh, uh, tend to co-occur basically in similar contexts, I can infer that these two words are similar in meanings or almost uh, synonymous in meanings. Well, as I told you, distributional semantics uh, is uh, quite uh, uh, hype nowadays, uh, very popular in computational linguistics, but it's not at all a new thing. Uh, actually, uh, uh, it, the first mention I found of distribution semantics go back to 1962 by Paul Garvin, in which he says that actually, uh, you see, distribution semantics is predicating the assumption that linguistic units with certain semantic similarity also share, also share certain similarities in the relevant environments, in the relevant context. So basically, the idea is the fact that if two words are similar, from similar meanings, they, they will tend to co-occur in the same similar context, and therefore, if we have computers strong enough and power enough to collect lots of these contexts, we can also understand if two words are close in meaning or not. Uh, basically, well, uh, the pioneers of distribution semantics uh, are actually not computational linguists. So we can found uh, uh, a linguist like Zilic Harris, the uh, uh, the, the, let's say the, uh, the supervisor and the mentor of Noam Chomsky, uh, one of the fathers of uh, um, uh, structural linguists, uh, in which exactly, uh, which uh, we exactly assumed or claimed that uh, the way to understand the meaning of two words is exactly by looking at the context in which they appear. And another, let's say, father of, uh, uh, of this type of way of conceiving meaning is John Firth, uh, who you might know for a very famous uh, 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 expression, you shall know a word by the company it keeps, namely, uh, you know a word, the meaning of the words, by looking at the words with which it uh, uh, goes with, with which it co occurs And again, this is nothing else that uh, something that which is normally and routinely used in distributional semantics. Uh, but uh, we also found another important thing, at least for, um, for me and I think for us now in this audience, is the fact that distributional semantics uh, is not only been uh, 
let's say, uh, uh, practicing in linguistics and computational linguistics, but also always in psychology. And uh, for instance, uh, George Miller uh, uh, talks about the notion of contextual representation. So his idea is the fact that when we hear a word used in language, we keep and update the representation of the context in which these words is occurred. Okay, and uh, uh, this uh, and basically the idea is the basically the knowing the, money, uh, the meaning of a word means to know the context in which these words can actually be uh, can actually be used. So concretely, uh, what distributional semantics does. So basically, the idea is this. Let's start from some linguistic context. So let's start from words that uh, occur in a certain context that we can find uh, in a corpus, we can find uh, in whatever text. And we can collect uh, uh, all the words that uh, are, for instance, close by to a certain target words. So we can, for instance, fix the window of two words to the left and two words to the side. We can look at uh, uh, which words appear within these words. And we can find that, for instance, car stands close to drive, uh, car, cat stands close to eat, uh, van again stands close to drive, and so on. And let's imagine that we don't collect only these small amounts of content, but we, we look for huge corpora, and we harvest the tons and tons of this, type of, uh, of this type of information. Well, the nicely thing is the fact that now, we can represent uh, this type of information uh, with vectors. In the sense we can use vectors uh, simply to compact all this type of distribution information. And now these vectors, what represent? These vectors basically represent how many times a certain word uh, has occurred uh, uh, with a certain context. For instance, we can imagine that uh, like a Cartesian space uh, whose dimensions are, for instance, linguistic context or words, and whose points in this space are also words. And basically, what, uh, what determines the position of a word in this space? Well, it, it's simply the type of context in which uh, these words has occur with. So for instance, the number, we see, we represent the word with the vectors, with a series of numbers, and these numbers record how many times this word has been close to drive, eat, and run. And for instance, in this case, we can see that the dog uh, has uh, a closer amount of numbers uh, uh, that, I mean, shares many contests with the cat, uh, but dog shares many, uh, much less contests with, uh, uh, with van. And if we represent this geometrically, this means that in a space, uh, dog and cat will appear close in a space uh, and farther away from van and car. And interestingly, is the fact that we can measure this distance. Okay, so we can measure how two vectors are close one to the other or are far away uh, one to the other. There are different ways to measure this. One is the so-called cosine, which is simply tells us, well, two words are closer if the angles of their vectors are small. So basically, the idea is the fact that if each word represents a vector, in this space, uh, the, the smaller this angle here, the closer two words are. And this is just nothing else than a formula that allows us to measure this, this similarity, okay? And at the end of the story, what we have, uh, well, we have a way in which we can calculate uh, this, uh, the distributional similarity, so how close are the distributional environments of these two words. And these numbers here simply tells how close are two words. For instance, uh, these are cosines, and a cosine is a number between zero and one. One means that the word is just similar to itself, and the higher the number, the, uh, the more similar are the two words. So in these cases, for instance, dog is quite similar to cat, but is, for instance, less similar to car, because these two numbers are just, uh, are just smaller. Okay, this is nothing else than a quantitative way to uh, represent uh, the similarity or the, as, this, as proximity and uh, the dissimilarity as distance uh, in a space, okay? So, <clears throat> so this is the advantage of representing uh, words and concepts in word in, uh, uh, as vectors, that we can measure the distance between with these vectors in the space. And with distributional semantics, one important aspect is this, these vectors are learned from text 
are learned from language and record how many times these words co-occur with different linguistic contexts. Now, uh, um, in the distributional semantics, uh, uh, there are many ways to build these vectors, uh, many models, uh, many methods, and uh, uh, these are called usually distributional semantic models. Uh, Distributional semantic models are nothing else than a way to say, okay, we have a method in order to learn, to acquire this vector-based representation from corpora. And of course, these, vect these methods uh, uh, differ for many type of, uh, uh, for many type of uh, uh, parameters, for many type of aspects. For instance, uh, for a long time, uh, for, many, for many years, this so-called latent semantic analysis has been the favorite method, especially in psychology. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, one very popular method is this one here that uses neural networks in order to learn, uh, uh, to learn representation. But the important thing is the simply that there are different methods to learn uh, representational words uh, uh, with vectors, encoding uh, uh, their distribution in, uh, uh, in linguistic context. Uh, as I told you, uh, well, this is just a kind of uh, a classification of different models that are, that are used nowadays. Uh, now, among, uh, for those that are more in the field, uh, uh, the most popular models are so-called neural embeddings. Uh, neural embeddings is just nothing else than a way to learn vectors using neural, uh, uh, using neural networks. Uh, there is an important aspect that I want you to, uh, uh, um, let's say, to, uh, uh, I want to, to, to point out, uh, uh, and it is the distinction between uh, so-called explicit vectors and implicit distributional vectors, in the sense that uh, 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 there are two types of uh, uh, distributional vectors that can be learned. In the most simple, in the simplest case, uh, vectors, uh, uh, the vector dimensions, uh, uh, encode a specific context in which uh, the words have been observed. So we can assume that, for instance, the first dimension of the word uh, of a vector corresponds to the, to the, con to the verb byte, the second to the, to the context by, and so on and so forth. This means that actually we can uh, take a vector representing bike and interpret uh, specifically the dimensions, uh, the context uh, in which it has occurred, because there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the dimensions and the specific, uh, uh, and the specific uh, uh, context. On the other uh, hand, another type of vectors, and these are the ones so-called embeddings uh, in the neural networks literature, represent vectors uh, with a very small numbers of dimensions. Usually, uh, when, we, when we take uh, a realistic vectors uh, of this side, this has thousands and perhaps hundreds of thousands uh, of dimensions, okay? And most of these dimensions are zero. And the reason why are zero is because uh, words have a Ziffian distribution and uh, words are choosy, so to speak, in the sense that they tend to co-occur only with uh, a small amount of context. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this also, uh, this, uh, this makes this matrix uh, full of zero. Uh, uh, neural networks and other methods uh, uh, use uh, a, a compact representation of these vectors, which is uh, obtained by uh, carrying out what is called dimensionality reduction. Dimensionality reduction is just a way to extract some information from the original data, uh, getting rid of noise and exploiting redundancies uh, in the data, with a drawback, unfortunately, that uh, what you obtain is the vector whose dimensions are not inter interpretable any longer, in the sense that there is no, or it's very hard to interpret the specific dimension. Look, here you can say that, for instance, uh, the, the second dimension corresponds to the verb to buy, but here, well, this is just uh, a kind of more abstract uh, information extracted from the data, but we are not able to assign any specific label to these dimensions. In these cases, with these type of vectors, uh, the interpretation comes from the relations between the vectors in the semantic space. Okay, I don't go into much details about that, but that's the basic difference. Now, uh, an important thing, uh, I told you that uh, the distributional hypothesis uh, is typically couched in terms of similarity. In the sense, we usually claim 
that the two words that are distributionally similar are semantically similar. But it's important to understand that the outcome, the product of these distributional models is not so much similarity, but relatedness, which is very different, which is a related but different issue. Let's consider this example. These are target words and these are neighbors. Neighbors are words that are close in space uh, to the targets, okay? So this means that the cosine between this word and this target here is very high, okay? You can, you can imagine it's a kind of neighbors uh, within, within the semantic space of dots. Okay, you can see here that in many cases, uh, the closest neighbors to the target are not at all semantically similar. Okay, so for instance, heat is not semantically similar to hungry. It's related to hungry because when you heat, it's because you are hungry. Okay, uh, and for instance, car is, can see be similar to truck and vehicle, but car is not tip similar to driving. Driving is an action that you perform with the car, so it's related with the car. This is an important distinction. Okay, similar means that you share a lot of features. They have similar shape, uh, similar functions, uh, or similar categories. Related means that, uh, I mean, as I told you, hungry and heat and food are all related one to the other, belong to the same situations, but they are not semantically similar. So this means that actually this type of uh, models uh, are more prone to identify networks of related or more semantically related. Uh, and, and this is, is a problem. In the sense, this means that the outcome of these models uh, is a very coarse uh, representation of meaning uh, under many respects, which we, we don't have to forget. Anyway, independent of the coarseness, uh, and as I told you, these models are very extensively used in artificial intelligence and in computational linguistics, but they have been shown to be, be, to be able to model lots of cognitive phenomena. So there are lots of work in cognitive science and in psychology showing that the data that uh, are derived by distributional models are able to model the way we represent concepts and the way concepts are organized in semantic memory, okay? And this concerns, uh, and this even concerns fMRI activations. So it has been shown that uh, representing words uh, with this distributional vector uh, uh, allow us to, to model uh, the activation areas of specific contexts in the human brain using uh, uh, magnetic resonance, okay? So this means uh, that this type of uh, models are useful for cognitive research and to model uh, behavioral data. And if we want to be, to dare a little bit more, this can be an indirect proof that indeed uh, parts of our semantic representation is distributional, in the sense that at least part of the information that uh, make up our concepts is uh, uh, in the form of distributional information derived from linguistic usage, as we were saying, uh, we're seeing at the beginning. Uh, <clears throat> okay, just to make a, a, a very quick recap, so basically we, uh, distributional semantics offer both a model to represent meanings with vectors and a way to learn these vectors from language data, but not only, because we can also learn this type of vectors using, for instance, from images and putting these two things together. Uh, remember, distributional representation are continuous because they're vector, gradable because, I mean, they can be measured their closeness in this space. It's not discrete, it's gradable representation. Uh, distributional semantics rely on what we could call a contextual or usage-based model of meaning. What I mean by this? In the sense that meaning is shaped by language usage. Okay, remember the word by, by Firth, remember the word by Harris, but this is also quite popular, for instance, in uh, cognitive linguistics or in construction grammar in uh, other type of uh, approaches to language. The output of a distributional model, we said it's a, it's a measure of similar, semantic similarity or more loosely a measure of semantic relatedness. And uh, important thing, uh, distributional semantics uh, is primarily a model of the lexicon. As you can see, until now, we have only talked about words, okay? It's good and most of the research that have been uh, also uh, mm, 
I mean, that has been uh, explored in which distributional semantics has been applied in cognitive science concerns words, single words. But this is not enough because language is not only single words. Language and uh, modeling language, understanding semantic representation, uh, it means to, to go beyond the domain of words. Okay, let's make a small experiment. Let's start with a small, uh, uh, with a cloud of words. Forget about syntax, just take these four words. I imagine that uh, although these are just words randomly placed in the space, you can form a coherent representation by gluing those, thing, those these things together. If you focus on that, you can just a specific event uh, pop up into your mind. And these specific events uh, is something that you can express with a specific sentence, okay? But you can see, you don't even need that sentence. You just look at these words, you imagine that they form something coherent. These words magically are able to glue together and to enter into a coherent representation. And uh, uh, this is something that uh, is, a okay, this ability is also part of the fact that uh, this is a very common event. You probably experienced, you did your, this event yourself, or you experienced this event in many situations. And this is probably also the reason why if we give uh, to Google this type of four words uh, without any syntax, also Google is able to, to recover uh, lots of this information that describe a specific event that we were expressing or representing with that sentence. Now, take these words. These words are related one to the other, right? They can allow, we can assume that they bring to, believe, to, uh, to belong to the same domain, book, book parts, book actions, and whatever. But I think, uh, at least for me, it's quite hard to combine them, to make a specific event uh, uh, that, and to glue them together uh, in, uh, in, in this way, although they are all semantically related. They all belong to the same domain, so to speak. And now, let's take these words. These words are very different one to the other, they belong to very different domains, uh, very different areas. We probably never experienced them together, but I believe that you also are able to, to build, again, a coherent event uh, or a coherent sentence uh, out of them. And, well, this could be something like that. A surfer reads a papyrus in a forest. It's a strange event, but we are able to, to generate this event simply by looking at this, uh, uh, and this, uh, at these entities. Why? Well, because a surfer may be a reader, like a student. Papyrus, well, that's not the typical things that I read, but it's a kind of book, or it can be a kind of book. It can be read as well. And, well, a forest, it's not a very typical thing where you can read it, but it's a location, so like a library. So again, you are able to glue these things together, so, although they are pretty new situation. And in these cases, we are much better than Google, because you can see if we give the, these four words to Google, we are not able to find any relevant ima image, exactly because it's a brand new event that we are not stored anyway, but we are able to construct on the fly, so to speak, or online while comprehending this sentence. Okay, uh, uh, what does this example uh, show us? Well, this example shows a, vein, a very uh, specific but crucial aspect that the fact that the brain is able to combine concepts to form coherent semantic representation of situans, situations and events, what we could call a kind of semantic binding or semantic gluing. Another interesting thing is that, of course, uh, syntactic structure is a powerful tool to allow us this combinatorial combination. If I say to you, a surfer reads a book in a library, the fact that you recognize a surfer as a subject, a library as a location, help us to identify those, these things. But we can see that it's a powerful tool, but it's not even always necessary, in the sense that uh, provided that we have uh, enough background knowledge, we are also able to combine these things together. And there are some work by uh, Binder and others, and by all, um, on the more theoretical side by Jackendorf, that again, uh, raise these issues on how much 
syntax and uh, how much our ability to build semantic representation is independent or parallel uh, to, the, uh, to the combinatorial uh, uh, tool provided by syntax. All together means, what does it mean? This means that the concepts have a combinatorial structure that allow them to be bound together to form a coherent representation. And this combinatorial structure is something which is surely linked to syntax, it's helped to syntax, so syntax is a kind of a powerful tool in order to carry out this type of gluing, uh, providing lots of cues with morphology, with order, and whatever, but we can do also something without them. In some extreme cases, we can do this. Okay, we can, we, can, we can have extreme cases in which we can even do uh, concept combination without having uh, much syntactic, uh, syntactic structure. Now, the problem is that how we model in semantic representation this concept gluing? Okay, that's, here is where symbolic representations have the so-called uh, the winning uh, uh, position. In the sense that in, in the symbolic tradition, it's easy to model this kind of conceptual gluing. Exactly adopting the notion of function and argument. In the sense, assuming that there are concepts that have variables, that have slots, okay? And other concepts that are able to fill these slots and to bind these variables in order to build a complex representation, okay? So for instance, uh, uh, and what is the outcome of this semantic representation? Well, it can be an event, or if you be, want to be more sophisticated, uh, somebody talks about it as a truth value, because it means that you are able to judge whether something is true or false. Did the surfer really read a book on the on a, a papyrus on a forest or not? Is it true or false? Okay. But the idea is exactly this. So we'll have something like read it has some slots in it, and perhaps there are um, the, uh, types that allow us to constrain which type of element uh, can fill this slot. So for instance, uh, uh, the reader must be necessarily animate. Okay? And there are elements that are able to fill these slots, building a coherent representation of this. So this type of gluing is very easy to be performed by, in symbolic representation. It's not at all easy to do it uh, with vectors. And exactly one problem is exactly this, how we can glue vectors together. And that's the topic uh, of uh, long-standing research in artificial intelligence and computational linguistics, uh, which is exactly the, how can we glue together uh, concepts in order to provide the semantic representation of sentences, of phrases, or even discourse. Well, the basically, uh, there is a lot of complicated, complex machine, mathematical machinery in this, which, but I will not go into details about that. Basically, the general idea is this. Since we have vectors that represent words, we use uh, operations between vectors to represent the glue that allow us to put this, these two things together. And there are many operations from linear algebra that allow us to, or that, uh, to make this, this glue uh, between, uh, uh, between concepts. Uh, for instance, we could simply add the vectors. So basically the idea that the representation of uh, uh, the surfer reads a papyrus in a forest uh, is simply a vector so obtained by summing the vectors of a single word, okay? Or we can make some more complex uh, things like uh, so-called tensor product or circular convolution. There are just terms for very complex uh, operations that we can, uh, we can use. Some researchers have also tried to say, okay, let's use the function argument uh, uh, me metaphor from symbolic representation like, uh, and do this. Like there are functions and arguments, uh, that are, there are also things, uh, 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 mathematical objects that behave like functions and others that behave like arguments. And they have used something like uh, tensor by vector multiplications uh, to, to perform this operation. Uh, what is the problem of, this, of all this research, in a way? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a huge uh, field which I cannot, of course, summarize, but uh, I mean, just to give you a hint. Well, compositionality, 
cannot, of course, uh, uh, model by simply summing the vectors of the words can, cannot be the whole story. We know that. Because, of course, what it will mean? Well, it will mean that uh, if the meaning of the sentence, a cat chases a mouse, is just the sum of the vectors of its word, this means that the meaning of a cat chases a mouse should be exactly the same as a mouse chases a cat. Because sum is commutative, and so summing a cat plus chases is just exactly the same as summing chases like cat. So it cannot be the whole story. Okay, that's, we all know that. But, Strangely enough, this is still the best performing uh, way uh, to, uh, to build uh, this type of representation. So when tested, all complex models uh, happen to perform or worse or not significantly uh, better than simple vector addition. And so there is something strange in it, something that really doesn't satisfy us. But there is also general intuitions about that. Okay, on the one hand, uh, uh, we, had, uh, we have a kind of solid intuition about what is a distribution representation of a world. We have said, what is a distribution representation of a world? It just encodes the other words uh, that that words had co-course with. So the fact that uh, the cat uh, co-course more with uh, uh, dogs or eat rather than wheel uh, and car. Okay? And the vector just encodes that. But it's not clear at all what is the distributional representation of a sentence. What does it mean? Okay, what is the distributional representation of a sentence like uh, uh, catches a mouse? Okay, we don't have clear intuitions about that. It's much clearer for us to imagine that uh, the representation of a sentence uh, is an event or a set representation of a situation. And in which sense a vector is able to represent an event uh, or a situation rather than a single, a single entity. Imagine that an event is not a single entity, it's a cluster of objects, okay? The surfer, the book, the papyrus, the forest, all glued uh, together. Okay, uh, in order to, uh, uh, to present you a different view on these things, uh, let me just uh, make some more, uh, some different assumptions that, uh, and some bring you some evidence from uh, uh, let's say, uh, cognitive, uh, mm, I mean, cognitive science. So basically, the idea is the fact that uh, uh, comprehending a sentence uh, is a co an incremental process that allows us to, to build a coherent semantic representation of event. Mm? Uh, this means that uh, it's, uh, it's the same process that we did when we were, were gluing together these words uh, in the cloud experiment uh, as before. And another important aspect is usually sentences are partial description of events. This means that we left out lots of details. Okay, we don't, we don't tell any details about situation. Okay. And uh, uh, several details are left implicit and can be recovered from the context. So for instance, if I say something like John surfed yesterday, I can infer the fact that John probably used the board that John was in the ocean or in the sea, but not on the lake, that John wore a swimsuit or a wetsuit and whatever. All these things are not mentioned in a sentence, but are part of the things that we understand when we understand the meaning of that sentence, okay? And this uh, brings in the fact that uh, lots of understanding involves our ability to predict. So understanding a sentence allows us to make predictions. Predictions about the things that have not been stated, uh, predictions about things that, that will be followed up uh, in, the rest, uh, in the rest of the discourse. And this aspect has been uh, uh, um, stressed in many ways in, in cognitive science. So for instance, in this work by Moshe Bar, uh, the idea, uh, he points out the, the, this idea that the brain is actually a proactive and predictive engine. So the fact that the brain is constantly engaged in making predictions. Prediction about, uh, and prediction help us in order to process the inputs, in order to anticipate uh, the things that will, uh, uh, that will come. And what our predictions uh, rest on? Predictions rest are memory based. Of course, we can predict things that are based on the memories of our past experiences. And what is the glue between uh, our past experiences uh, and what we predict uh, is a similarity 
or why we call it analogy, but use analogy in the, sen in the sense that we'll, I use the term similarity. So basically, I have lots of memories of past experience, uh, and I use uh, and I predict that similar things will happen, uh, um, in, uh, happen in the world. And Andy Clark has also stressed this, this idea of uh, the crucial role of prediction uh, in the brain. And uh, uh, an important fact, and in fact, uh, there is a, an, a crucial difference, a cognitive difference, between uh, these two sentences here. A student reads a book in a library, and a surfer reads a papyrus in a forest. In the sense that it's true that we have a potentially handless capacity to build a sentence representation of a novel sentence like this. So we are able to build a semantic representation of a new thing like this. But crucially, the sentences react in a different way, the brain reacts in a different way when this new sentence is presented with respect to an old sentence. So basically, we process uh, have this, this novel sentences have a div different cognitive status from old sentences. And this different status is notoriously uh, registered, for instance, uh, uh, in, uh, with the uh, event-related potentials, uh, and for instance, for the, by the different amount of the so-called N400 um, uh, uh, component, uh, which is higher for th th things that are novel, less expected, uh, less predicted, uh, or less predictable with respect to things that are new, uh, that are known, that are well uh, uh, predictable from the context. So what does it mean, this? Well, it means that uh, what we can assume, that it means that, uh, on the one hand, uh, productivity, so the ability to understand novel sentences, surely entails that not everything can be stored in our memory. And that's a classical argument for compositionality. We, we need, we, we, my, our, the brain is able to construct new things by gluing things together. On the other hand, uh, data suggests that there is also a lot of stored knowledge about uh, uh, concept contingencies, concept combinations that are stored in our memories, that are used by, uh, by, by processing. And this means that, uh, and this knowledge is activated by linguistic items during this processing and affects language processing. And, the combi and uh, usually combinations that are more distant from the things that we have stored in memories uh, cost more from the cognitive point of view with respect to things that are known or are simply retrieved from the memory. Uh, okay, basically, uh, the idea is the fact that which type of knowledge is stored? Well, we have uh, lots of knowledge about single entities, but we have also lots of knowledge about associations between entities, okay, and the relations between entities. And this is uh, what, uh, for instance, Ken McRae and others called uh, generalized knowledge. So knowledge about the typical events and typical participants, okay? And uh, the knowledge about the typical events is simply the fact that, uh, and this type of knowledge, again, derives from different sources, derived from direct experience, for instance, because we go to restaurant or we, we go to libraries, but also from linguistic experience, because we read about uh, restaurants, we read about libraries, and we read about what happens in this, uh, uh, in this type of situations. And basically, the idea uh, in this model is the fact that the linguistic expressions uh, are simply cues that activate uh, different aspects of this knowledge that we have stored. And this knowledge is combined during sentence process in order to allow the understanding of, uh, of new situations. Now, uh, this type of stored knowledge is something that he also used in order to, uh, as an effect, for instance, during, the, uh, uh, during online sentence processing, in the sense that we are able to uh, automatically understand uh, whether a certain argument is more typical for a predicate than others. So for it's, this is what is called the thematic fit. Thematic fit is the ability of an argument to fit, to complain with the expectations of, uh, uh, of, the, of a certain predicate. So for instance, uh, arrest a tree is impossible. But both arrest a thief and arrest a policeman are possible. But arrest a thief is much more prototypical than arrest a, uh, than arrest a policeman. 
okay? And uh, we are, uh, and subjects have clear uh, uh, ideas about uh, what is possible, what is impossible, and what is typical and atypical in this context. And interestingly, this type of information can be well modeled by, with distributional semantics. And distributional semantics is used, they can be used exactly to model these judgments. And the idea is similar. What, why uh, thief uh, is uh, a typical th uh, person who is arrested? Because thief is very similar to the, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the entities that are typically arrested. So basically what we do in distributional semantics, uh, we can simply say, okay, let's take some arguments of a verb. For instance, uh, argument of a verb eat, apple, meat, pasta, and pizza, and we represent all these things as vectors. And by combining the vectors, for instance, by simply making the sum or an average, we can make a new vectors, which is the kind of vectors that represent, let's say, the typical things that are eaten, that are eaten. okay? And then we can simply compare a new object with, as a vector with these vectors. And by measuring these similarities, we can understand with which things are eaten, which things are eatable, which things are things that are prototypically eaten, like, for instance, uh, a cake, or things that are less prototypically eaten from a human, for instance, I don't know, an ant. Okay? Okay. Uh, as a, <coughs> basically, uh, all this information, all this type of uh, data have been uh, put together uh, by us in, a, in what we are trying to call, I mean, in, in a model we are trying, we are developing in collaboration also with, uh, uh, with Philippe Blush at uh, Ex Marseille University, uh, which is exactly the idea of using all these different uh, data coming from cognitive representations to propose a different way to use distributional representation, distributional semantics uh, to model sentence comprehension. Basically, the idea, our idea and our model is the following. We have uh, what we call the memory component and the unification component. A memory component, uh, and this is inspired so to, the, uh, to a model called the memory unification and control model by uh, Peter Agort. Basically, what the memory component does? The memory component stores uh, generalized event knowledge, so knowledge about events in two, in, uh, uh, and um, uh, event and situation, that we model with distributional information extracted from corpora. So we use distributional information not only to model single words, but also to model the associations that these words have uh, in forming events and, uh, uh, and situations. The idea is that during sentence processing, lexical items, but actually in our view also constructions in general, like multi-word expressions and whatever, activate portions of these, uh, uh, these representations that are unified to form a coherent semantic representation of the event uh, expressed by the sentence. And uh, interestingly, each compositional uh, operation is associated to, to what we call the semantic composition cost. The semantic composition cost is basically answer this question, how expensive is to build uh, this uh, semantic representation? Because we have seen that not all sentences are equal. Some tenses are easily more processable than others. So what is the cost of this semantic representation? And according to us, uh, the, this uh, composition cost depends on two factors. The fact that some structures are available in our memories and they can be simply retrieved because they are there, they're stored, okay? And on the other hand, uh, the cost of, of uh, making a semantic representation coherent. The idea is the fact is that uh, the more coherent is a semantic representation, so, so the more the pieces of the semantic representation are things that are, go well together, the easier it is to process uh, 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 this type of structure. Okay. That's the idea. That's the, the, the idea of our uh, network. So basically what we do is we build, uh, we consider, we represent this uh, uh, with uh, <coughs> In five minutes, and I will, and, and I will close. Uh, we'll skip some things, but uh, just to give you the hints. Uh, so uh, the idea is the fact that uh, we have uh, a, a network of uh, interrelated uh, items uh, uh, and events and participants, which are stored. 
And the interesting thing is that uh, each of these elements is a vector, is a distributional vector. But these vectors are linked uh, one to the other by relations that bind them together into a network of events and situation and co-occurrences, okay? So basically, it's a kind of hybrid representation. You see, this, the idea is that uh, these concepts, uh, these vectors are already glued, but are already glued in our memories, are already glued in our um, typical associations that we found uh, uh, in, in, the general, in the general knowledge. For instance, in these cases, we can see that uh, a student uh, reads, a thesis, uh, uh, reads a book, write a thesis, and so on. What is an event? An event is just a path in this network. For instance, the event of a student reading a book, or a student or a professor reading a thesis, or an archaeologist reading a papyrus, and so on. And the idea is the fact that the lexical items activate this type of representation during sentence processing in a kind of similar vein to the standard spreading activation. And for instance, a student uh, activate uh, a portion of the graph uh, with respect to the different type of events which involves a student, uh, but also read, uh, activate uh, different type of portions uh, of these elements. But the point is that uh, this is not enough because we have to bring this thing together, okay? And the idea is the fact that uh, uh, during sentence processing, uh, we model semantic composition exactly as a process of uh, event retrieval and construction. So basically, semantic composition is a, uh, mm, and uh, uh, the, basically uh, is a process that aims at re uh, re recovering uh, events that are stored in our memories or to construct new events uh, from pieces stored in our memory. Given a sentence, what is the interpretation of this sentence is just the event that best explains its linguistic cues. That's the idea. And of course, there can be two situations. An event can be simply something stored and available in our memory, or can be something that is constructed by linking together portions of, the, of this information. And so, for instance, uh, if I read something, a student reads a book, uh, we simply retrieve uh, the event uh, of this uh, uh, story in our memory. But if I process something like uh, a surfer reads a papyrus, uh, what we be is do is we build a new, a new event uh, by linking together uh, things that are not stored in a memory. And uh, uh, as I told you, the idea is that we choose the event that the best explains. What does it mean to best explain? Best explains according to two parameters. The degree of activation, which means that uh, the event, uh, uh, we, we choose the event that it is activated the most cues in the, lingu in the, uh, in the, uh, in the linguistic item, uh, by the linguistic items in the sentence, which we, 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 we measure with a, uh, with a score which is called sigma. And uh, on the other hand, the internal semantic coherence of new events stored in memory component. So basically, and uh, it is the joint effect of these two elements that explains this idea that the sentence processing is a balance between storage and computation. On the one retrieving, on the one composing and uh, gluing things together. Uh, just to the, what, is, what does it mean, the mutual typicality? Mutual typicality means uh, that uh, cert certain things are typical actors in a certain event. So, for instance, a surfer is uh, similar enough to typical readers, uh, but, for instance, is not uh, similar enough to typical papyrus readers. So this makes a sentence like uh, a surfer reads a papyrus acceptable, but not at the, uh, let, uh, as pro so prototypical or so easily processable than uh, a, a student reads a, papyrus, uh, uh, reads a book. And this a semantic timidity is measured with thematic fit cosine. So basically, we use the vectors in the, this semantic representation in order to estimate how similar are the things in the, um, how, how, I mean, how coherent is a semantic representation. Okay, just to going back, okay, we have uh, uh, applied these models to, to model different types of cognitive data. 
coming from the psycholinguistic literature. I don't have the time to, to go into details because I want to spend uh, the few minutes to the, to the conclusions. Uh, And these are the conclusions that I want to draw. Namely, first of all, conclusion about distribution representation. Uh, language shapes our semantic representation. This is something which is almost nowadays agree on. Of course, the interesting question is how much it uh, is, uh, uh, how big is this effect? Okay, so for instance, what is the neat contribution of language vis-a-vis uh, -vis other type of uh, uh, empirical data, for instance, a sensory uh, or um, sensory, uh, sensory experience? Uh, we have seen that uh, distributional semantics is not a panacea, okay? It's not uh, the new uh, uh, wonderful uh, way to represent meaning. It offers a lot of, uh, uh, it has a, actually a coarse-grained uh, style of representation. It cannot distinguish between similarity and relatedness. In many cases, the representations are uh, very, very coarse. And uh, we can see that still, uh, uh, I mean, having a simple theory how we build the meaning of a sentence or even a discourse is complex, or, and probably we don't yet have a, a very convincing story about that, okay? On the other hand, uh, the fact that we work with uh, continuous and distributed uh, representation allow us to give us a lot of advantages. Tackling greatness, context dependencies, the ability to learn representation from data, and last but not least, uh, providing bridges with uh, neurocognitive models, because we are, in a way, speaking about, talking about the same language, talking about the same way of representing meaning. Uh, distributional semantic descent and process. As I told you, distribution information is not only relevant to build the vectors, but it's also, uh, uh, let's say, useful in order to model the network of associations that link different type of words, and that are part of our everyday knowledge that we use during the uh, sentence, uh, uh, sentence processing, and which is so crucial, uh, so crucial for us. And this is, uh, reminds me, and I was, uh, this is a kind of suggestion I want to bring to you, of a recent paper by Jeffrey Binder, in which exactly makes a similar, has a similar idea. In the same, on the one hand, we have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, neural activation of objects, perhaps at a very low level of sensory motor features, for instance, uh, the features representing a dog or the features representing this table. But then we need to have more abstract representations that link, for instance, a dog with a leash, with the action of walk, with park, or that link uh, this door or this table with the room, uh, with the lectures, and so on. Okay. And this type of representation, this type of associations uh, are of a more abstract level, what he calls conjunct cross-modal conjunctive representation, so a more abstract level of representing things. And this is not very different from this idea. So on the one hand, we have vectors of single entities, but also we have representations of their associations uh, that link them together. Uh, distribution information is retrieved and combined during language comprehension. And this is a powerful tool for us because we can make predictions and generate expectancies. For instance, from our knowledge about uh, students reading books, we can expect that they read it in library. Okay. And this make, uh, uh, allow us to make some inferences and to fill in, uh, to fill in details. And I would like also to say that uh, this idea, in a way, re try to redesign the boundary between uh, uh, what is stored and what is processed, also what is idiomatic and what is compositional. So in the classical story, uh, what, idiomatic expressions, things like key the bucket, are of course stored in our uh, lexicon, while things like uh, kick a ball are simply composed uh, online uh, with rules. But the idea is probably that uh, we actually are able to retrieve uh, a lot of things that are simply compositional, and we retrieve them without constructing online, simply because they are very frequent and simply because they are uh, things that are usually exposed to. Uh, but how is the ability uh, and where the ability to understand the novel sentences come from? Well, the idea is the fact that we retrieve and we combine information stored in our distribution representation. And uh, uh, the important thing is the fact that uh, uh, the, the salience 
And the importance of a new event, an event that we have never encountered before, like the surfer reading a papyrus, uh, it depends on how similar is to things that are expected or similar to things that are stored in our representation. And this similarity can be measured thanks to distributional semantics and to vector representations. We have seen that the vector representations are good to measure this, and we can do it also in this way. So basically, my last word is this, that uh, language productivity, so the ability to produce new sentences, to understand new sentences, to combine concepts, uh, can be conceived also to the capacity to adapt our knowledge to novel situations. So basically, productivity is a kind of an adaptation, and adaptation can be driven by similarity. And I stop here, and I, these are my collaborators on this project, and thank you very much. <laughs>